most holy. And then you also had an outer court and an inner court, but the courtyard. But we had a holy place and a most holy or holiest of all. One day when I was looking at this story, because I really wanted to understand about the sanctuary, not because I'm worried about, not from a legal standpoint. I wanted to understand the sanctuary because God said, you are the temple of the living God. And I was like, if I'm the temple of the living God, all of that back there was shown to us so that I could understand what that means under the new covenant. When I looked up the word holy place, there's another name for it in the, in the Old Testament. It was called the tabernacle or the tent of the congregation. So God was in the most holy place. There was a veil, and then there was the tent of the congregation. So even within the sanctuary, there was a symbol of, here's my bride, and here's me. But we can't become one yet because there's this veil between us. Do you understand? Well, then Solomon came along. King David wanted to build the temple, and Solomon came, and, and King David told him, he said, I'm going to let your son build it because you've got too much blood on your hands. Solomon built the temple, and when you read about that in Kings and in Chronicles, it gives great detail about what took place. The one thing that struck me the most was the praise, the praise that was offered there. Because Israel knew that when we see this glory of God, we know God's with us. We know that God's with us. We don't have to just walk by faith. We know He's in there. When Solomon dedicated that temple and they offered thousands of sacrifices, which were really a symbol of the sacrifice of praise, it says the glory of God came down and it filled the entire temple. It filled the tabernacle of the congregation. That's us. It didn't just fill the holy place or most holy. It filled the holy place. It filled us. I need to see if this thing... Um, did I skip one? Okay, good. Thank you, sir. If we are the temple of the living God, which we know we are, if our families and our homes and our churches are the body of Christ, God wants to fill His entire body, each and every one of us, our homes and our families, with His glory. The only way to do that, though, is through faith. You can't take somebody that has no interest in God. And I'll give you an example. When I first accepted Christ, when I first believed in Christ, I knew He was coming back, and I saw so many people that didn't know, and I thought, I can scare them. I mean, not in a bad way, but I really thought that would work. If I could tell them, if I could show them... Do you know what's about to happen? Do you know the plagues that are about to fall? And even now I can go on YouTube and there's some well-meaning Christians out there that have got some, they're powerful films, but I'll watch a 10-minute clip of it and when I get up from my chair, there's a spirit of fear. It's not, I can't get on the ark because I'm scared to death of, of hell. Because the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And Jesus said in Revelation that the fearful and the unbelieving are going to perish. I can't frighten somebody into accepting Christ. So how do you win them? How do you win somebody who's not there yet, whose eyes have not been opened? They have to know the glad tidings. Listen to what this verse says. Galatians chapter 3, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith proclaimed before the glad tidings unto Abraham saying, now read that with me, in thee shall all the nations or the families of the earth be blessed. 
Remember we talked about blessing in the previous message? Blessing is praising. Blessing is speaking God's blessing upon somebody. He says this is the gospel. This is the glad tidings that the heathen will be justified by faith. Now many Christians, well-meaning Christians, we often become like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, we'll spend, and, and I hate to say it, but as Seventh-day Adventists, our number one hobby is to debate one another over technicalities. I mean, we can spend hours arguing amongst ourselves over what is this and what is that and, and where do we, you know, straining at a gnat, but we're swallowing an entire camel. And I look at Jesus and I think, that's what he was going through. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are debating. They're in there in conference and they're debating and arguing and, and Jesus is out there and he's feeding the hungry and he's healing the sick and he's casting out the demons. One of the things that we often argue about is righteousness by faith. And I have many and I used to be one of them. Justification by faith is one thing. Righteousness by faith is completely different. Let me, let me share something with you. When you look up the word justify, let me see if I've got it on the next screen. Look what it says. To render or to declare innocent, holy, and righteous. You can't take a sinner and make him a saint any other way. And let me give you an example. In John chapter 3, a man came to Nicodemus or came to Jesus. Nicodemus came at nighttime, and he was an older member of the Sanhedrin. Jesus is a young, a young man, 30, 33 years old. He's young. In their eyes, he had just become a man at 30 years old. So here's this older, who knows, 60, 50, 70, 80. And he comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want the rest of his peers to know that he's there talking to Jesus. Because he's a young, he, he, he's like A.T. Jones or E.J. Wagner. Who are these young upstarts? They haven't even been in the message that long. And Nicodemus began the conversation, but Jesus knew, Yeshua knew what Nicodemus really needed, what all of us really need. Nicodemus was like, I used to be a pagan, I used to be a whoremonger, I used to drink and smoke and go to Hollywood movies, and, but praise God, I keep the Sabbath now. Praise God, I, I don't do those things anymore. Praise God, I'm doing all the right things that you've told me to do. Do you know what Jesus said to him? He said, you don't understand. All your feast keeping, all your Sabbath keeping, all your vegetarianism, all your tithe paying, all... It's all worthless until you're begotten again. And the reason that matters is, is because we have to have a clean slate. If we have fallen one time, eternity's out. We can't earn eternity. We can't have eternal life except we have a perfect record. And Ellen White says that. The requirements for eternal life are perfect obedience. Okay, so if you've sinned one time, you're out. You no longer can say, I have perfect obedience. Lord, I've got perfect obedience except for that one sin. I mean, can you imagine if you'd only sinned one time in your entire life? And you go to the Lord and you say, I do have that one. He's, the wages of one sin is death. One sin. The requirements for eternal life are perfect obedience, not almost perfect. There's only one that fits that. There's only one man, the man Christ Jesus. God manifests in the flesh that ever lived a perfect life. And that's what he gives to us in exchange for ours. It says to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. And I capitalize that because he explains it. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, to thy seed, which is Christ. Do we understand now why Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, I, 
I pray that they all will be one as I am in you and as you are in me, that they also might be one in us to thy seed, a husband and a wife, a husband and a wife whose veil has been removed and who have consummated the marriage. They have become one. This was prophesied in Isaiah 45. He says, for, look at this word. What does that say? For, I can't hear you. In the Lord. In the Lord shall all the children of Israel be justified. In Christ Jesus. The whole goal is to be in Him. And I remember I was reading, turn with me to Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. And I encourage you this week to read Galatians 1 and, and Galatians chapter 2. And when you read it, read it out loud and put your name in the promises. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Read this with me. It says, According as He hath chosen us, what's the next phrase? In Him, before the foundation of the world. When you go up to somebody that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that have not given their lives to Him, maybe they're an atheist. Did you know that according to Scripture, you can tell them that they already have been chosen in Christ? It's not future. It was already done. That's the glad tidings. And I asked the Lord when I read that, I was like, I've been chosen in Christ? And it says in verse 6, to the praise of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted. What's that last phrase? In the beloved. Who is the beloved? This is my well-beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says that we are in Christ. And if you go back and read, send me an email if you want the quotes. Ellen White was shown. The Lord revealed to her and showed her something beautiful. When Christ was baptized and he asked his father, will you accept all of them in me? Every human being, including Nicodemus, that has been born one time was born in Adam. You're born in Adam. The Bible says we were born sinners. We're not sinners because of something we did. We were born that way. We sin because that's, that's our nature. Jeremiah tells us that. Jeremiah says a leopard can't change his spots. Neither can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin. He said, if they could, then may you who are accustomed to, to do evil learn to do good. Do you know what Job says? Job says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not even one. That doesn't do away with God's law. It doesn't do away with God's righteousness. But it means we have to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he tells us there that he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And I asked the Lord, I was like, I went through this chapter, chapter 1 and chapter 2 in Ephesians, and I uh, highlighted every single time I saw it use the phrase, in Christ, in whom, in him, I was shocked. And then I started looking all through the New Testament scriptures. It's all through the New Testament scriptures. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, in other words, the only way for me to make it to heaven is to be found in Him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is by the law, but the righteousness which is of Him by faith. I said, okay, okay, and I was so excited. How do I get in Him? Turn with me to 2, I believe it's 2 Corinthians. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. And remember what Sister White told us. She said, righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And she said, people wrote to her and asked, what is justification by faith? And she said, let me tell you what it is. It's God humbling the glory of man in the dust 
and doing for him that which it is impossible for us to do for ourselves. I can want to do the right thing, and my heart's not right, and I know it. You know it. When you're there and a thought passes through your mind and you're like, I don't want those thoughts anymore, I'm going to make it leave. You can't make it leave by yourself. Christ says, you can't do anything without me. And something that struck me was, I was reading in Desire of Ages, and there's a statement. And she said that from the beginning of creation, God had one purpose. That was for every created being, including the seraphim and the cherubs and all of the angels, every created being God purposed to be a dwelling place for himself. And I read that and I thought, now wait a minute. And all of a sudden I started understanding what went through with the battle in Lucifer's heart. Do you remember when Elijah went up on the, in the mountain, he was hiding in the cave? And Christ came to him in the cave and he's like, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah's like, you know, Jezebel. And he's like, my dad wants to talk to you outside. Literally. And it says Elijah went outside and it says there was a great earthquake and there was a great fire and lightning and there was a wind. And it says God wasn't in any of those things. And then he says there was a still, small voice. That was God. And I realized, and Ellen White, she confirmed this, that was God speaking in Lucifer's heart, not controlling him, but whispering his divine influence in his heart. And Lucifer said, I don't need your divine influence. I mean, I don't need you whispering in my ear. Let me, let go of my hand, Daddy. Let go of my, I can do this by myself. That's the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. That's us today. Do you know what Christ said in the Old Testament? And what the Father said to Christ, he said, I will hold you by your hand. And I will leave, and Christ was like, hold my hand. I can't do this as a man without you. So when we realized that what God wanted to do was is to whisper his influence into our hearts and our hearts to be so one that we would submit. We would delight to do his will and his law would be written in our hearts. For thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands command ye me. I'm going to tell you from personal experience. When I was 17, 18, 16, 20 years old, I was so lost, it, it's not even funny. I cursed God every day, not because I was angry at him. I just thought he didn't matter. I blasphemed his name. I drank hundreds of dollars worth of alcohol every week. I partied and I, I spent my private time with whoever I wanted to. And my mom and my grandmother, they were on their knees for a week or 10 days. Both of them agreed and they said, we've got to pray for Eric. And they began fasting and praying and claiming promises. Isaiah 49, they claimed that promise. My mom still had that marked in her Bible. She was like, God, you promised that you will save my children. God did. When I ran away from God and had left my wife and children for five years, Sarah came over to the apartment, I can remember, and she would be there and she'd come over and try to talk to me and try to get me to come home and she'd write little notes and say, I love you, I miss you. And it was like the devil that was controlling me and influencing me, the other voice that I had yielded my ear to, it would make me so angry when I saw those notes. I would get furious. And you know, the Lord spoke to my wife and he told her, he said, Sarah, he said, if you want Eric to come home, you're going to have to let me do this. You're trying like Sarah did to produce this, child on your own and it's not working you can't beget yourself again by yourself and the Lord started working and my wife started praying and fasting and claiming promises 
And she said, what you have joined together, let no man put asunder. God, you swore that. I claim that promise. And people would come to my wife and say, well, what are you going to do now that you're divorced? And she would say, I'm not divorced. But Eric's, Eric divorced. I mean, that paper was signed three years ago. Sarah was like, I don't care what the judge did. God's the one that joined us together. The judge has no, he has no weight in this. Now, let me give you an example in your life and in my life. Do you have a family member that's lost? Do you have a relationship that's not what God wants? I remember sitting there in Sabbath school one week, and we were discussing God's promises, and this lady, this lady or this gentleman, they said, well, we know we can promise. We can claim God's promises, you know, for our children because, you know, God does say if you raise them up in the way they should go, they won't depart from it. He said, yeah, but they have free will. And, you know, I was sitting there, and the, that a huge question mark came to my mind. I was like, God, he's right. Yeah, but. And you know what the Lord said to me? Yeah, but is not one of my words. <laughs> you don't find God saying, yeah, but. God said, you have to claim the promise in faith. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord if he wavers. If my wife had wavered and said, ah, I don't really know if it, daddy's going to come home or not. Or if my mom and grandmother had wavered and said, you know, Lord, please save Eric. He does have free will. Please. I would have never come home. We have to do like Jacob did and we have to say, God, you swore to me. And I look at that sometimes and I think, Lord, I'm scared. I don't want to go to you. Who am I to go to God and wrestle with him? Look up what Ellen White had to say about wrestling with God. She said, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence, and the violent taketh it by force. And I used to struggle with that. I was like, what in the world does that mean? And then I read and she said, this is what Jacob did when he refused to let go of Christ, when he was wrestling with him there in the in the wilderness that night. This is what that woman did when she came to Jesus and said, my daughter's got a demon. Will you please come cast it out? And Jesus said, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to dogs. He called her a dog. Not because he really thought she was, but he wanted to see if she would push and press her case to the throne. And you know what she said? She said, yay, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. That's what he's waiting for us to do. Do you remember it talks about in the Bible about the fact that we're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble? That's not, forget about the heathen trying to kill me. I know that's going to come. Forget about the mark of the beast and going to jail. I know that's coming. That's not the greatest battle I've got. The greatest battle I've got is on my knees saying, God, you swore you would clean my heart. You swore you would restore my family. You swore you will save my son and my daughter. You know what it's like when you see teenagers because the temptations are coming so fast. Ellen White said, wrestle with him. There's nothing that he enjoys better. What happened when Jacob wrestled with Christ? Christ changed his name. He was a deceiver and a swindler, and Christ said, you're no longer that. Now you are a prince with God because you have wrestled and prevailed. Imagine that our Savior wants us to do that. And I have nothing I can plead in my wrestling. Dear Lord, I did this and I, I've done this and I obeyed you here. All my righteousness is filthy rags. I have one thing that I can plead. You swore. You promised me. And Christ Jesus is that word. He says, ask me concerning the work of my hands. Your children and you, the work of my hands. And then talking about Christ, he says, I have raised him up in righteousness. Talking about Christ, he was raised by faith. And I will direct his ways and he shall build my city, my people and my city, which is called by my name, Daniel chapter 9 says. For thus saith Jehovah that created the heavens, yea, God, Elohim himself that formed the earth. I have not spoken in secret, 
in some dark place of the earth. I said not unto the children of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. God didn't tell you to search for him with all your heart and then he's not going to show up. For I the Lord that speak righteousness am mighty to save. This is where we are today. The whole world, you look out at the world, even look in our churches, look in our congregations. There's so many people that are hurting. They're hurting. And yes, we need to share the doctrines. Um, we had a, a baptismal class that we started at this church. And I've never led a baptismal class before. So I started searching for the Lord, you know, what, what needs to be taught here? And you know what I found? When I was in a baptismal class, they taught me about the state of the dead. And they taught me about, you know, the millennium. They taught me about the rapture. So I knew the facts. And I walked away from church at 14 years old. The facts did not save me. And then I read something that was written by W.W. W. Prescott, if I remember correctly, in 1895 at a camp meeting or 1905 in Australia. But he, he shared a series of messages, and there was something that was brought out that has changed my life. Why does the state of the dead matter? Yes, demons are going to impersonate our lost loved ones. I haven't had one show up at my house yet. And I know they will, but that's not the big issue. The state of the dead is this. The dead know not anything. Our old man and our old woman that died with Christ knows not anything. If the dead know not anything, that voice is not the old man. It's the enemy impersonating him. The dead know not anything. To be baptized into Christ is to be baptized into his life, into his death, into his resurrection, into his victory. So sharing, that's what changes this wilderness into Eden. Listen to what Ezekiel was shown. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out, and he sent me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. That's us. And each of us have ups and downs. And I know there's some days where it's like, I feel like, man, I could take on the world and the devil and everything all by myself. God is like, his presence is so full. And then there's other days where that's not there. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I say, Lord, I feel so dry inside. Help me. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. It's all of us. They say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, and we are cut off from our parts. Bone over here and a bone over here and the skull bones back there and the ribs are all scattered. What do you do with that? That's irreparable. Do you want to know something? God didn't come to fix up our broken car. He didn't come to patch up our humanity. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Isaiah says, and he saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. That's us and our families. Are we interceding for our loved ones? Are we interceding for all of those employees at the place where we work? Are we interceding for all of the children at the mall and, and the people at the stores? Therefore, his arm, the Lord Jesus Christ, brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ, it sustained him. For Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my king hath forgotten me. 
But can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Can you imagine that? And we're seeing it in the news today. And the Lord says, Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Anytime you see that, those two words, will I or I will, that's God's will. In Hebrews, it says it's by the will of the Lord that we're sanctified. You go, well, what is God's will? Find a place where he says, I will, and you're guaranteed that's his will. He says, I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven you upon the palms of my hands, your walls, your home, that room where you cry out your tears before the Lord. That time when you're in the car by yourself and you're wrestling with temptation or you're wrestling with doubts or the devil's telling you you've done too much, your sins are too big. I mean, you, you've got to have done this 30 times this month alone. He says, your walls are continually before me. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I will both search out my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. The author of life says, Satan is the destroyer but I am your restorer. I will spare you so that you may become acquainted with me and believe on my name. Do you know I had somebody tell me one time, they were like, you know, I thank God. A guy, he actually came into my work. Um, I worked part-time at a health food store. And he came in there and the Lord brought him there. And he started talking to me about the Lord and he was so hopeless. He said, Eric, he said, I can remember years ago when I would hear God's voice when I was reading my Bible. He said, I can't hear God's voice anymore. He said, I remember God told me I needed to go forward on this one day. And he said, I didn't go. And he said, since that day, I've not been able to hear God's voice anymore. And I looked at him. I said, the devil is lying to you. It's not God that told you that he wasn't going to listen to you anymore because you didn't go forward to an altar call. I said, why are you here? If you were lost, you wouldn't even be interested in your salvation. The only reason you're here is because he has come seeking you. Don't think the devil won't quote scripture. He did to Christ. And he said, Therefore, O son of man, Speak unto the house of Israel and say, Thus you speak, saying, If our transgressions, our rebellion and apostasies, and our sins, our habitual, habitual failures be upon us, and we are consumed in them, how shall we then live? Lord, I can't make this stop. I can't stop from feeling this way. I feel rejected. I feel bitter. I'm angry. I'm, and I don't know what. I'm unforgiving and I want to forgive, but I don't know how. If these sins are upon me and I'm destroyed in them, how do I then live? Listen to what he says. You read this in Ezekiel. Say unto them, as I live. How, how did Christ live? By faith. By faith. For the just shall live by faith. And you know, the book of Acts tells us there's only been one that was just. The just is Jesus Christ. The just shall live by faith. When he came up out of that tomb, he came up because his father called him through an angel. Thou son of God, your father calls thee. What was the last thing that Jesus said to his father before he gave up his breath? Into your hands I give my spirit, the blueprint, my character, my identity. Why would he do that if he thought the Father wasn't going to raise him? He was battling just like us. The devil was telling him, you're guilty of the whole world's sins. 
You're guilty of pedophilia. You're guilty of murder, of rape, of stealing, of lying, of cheating, of blasphemy. Do you know what Eric Wilson did? You're taking all of his sins. There's no way that God can forgive these. It's too much. God can't be just and do that. And Christ said, I remember at the beginning of creation when you and I entered into a covenant with one another. And Father, I promised you I would bear their sins. And you made a promise to me that if I would bear them, you would forgive them all. And Christ said, even though I don't feel it, I'll lay hold of that promise. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And on that third morning, when that angel came down, and the Bible, the Bible tells us, and Ellen White gives us greater detail, she said the earth quaked before his tread. As he got close to the earth, the whole earth trembled and shook. The scripture says there was an earthquake. That was because of that one angel. And do you know when she says, when that angel cried out, there's a couple of places where she says he didn't call his name. She said, he said, thou son of God, your father calls thee. That promise is ours. We are sons and daughters of God. And it doth not now appear what we shall be, but we know when he appeareth we shall be like him. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, for the just shall live by faith. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Remember, this is about your home and about our families. It's about our church. Do you know a conference church or a home church or an independent church? It doesn't matter. Do you know a church that needs the spirit of the living God? Do you know people that need to have such a relationship with Christ that they hear his voice in the morning? For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all of your waste places. Yea, he will make your wilderness like Eden and your deserts like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. And I'm going to share something real quick with you. I, I don't like doing this personally because I don't want to, I, I want to be careful. But last night, when we had all this family come to my mom and her husband's, um, and there was a, a good part of us that are Christians, and there was a part of us that don't profess Christ, don't go to church. What do you do? Last night was Sabbath evening. And my mom, my stepdad, Wayne, I love Wayne. I mean, I love Wayne. He's, he's, he's a great man. He came to me and he said, Eric, he said, we need to pray. He said, because some of the family that is here have already expressed their feelings about we're not going to be able to do anything fun tonight because it's y'all keeping the Sabbath and, you know. And I looked at him and I was like, I mean, it's the Sabbath. We can't not keep the Sabbath because we've got people here that don't know. And then the Lord spoke to me. He's like, Eric, be careful. You're walking on dangerous ground. You're on the verge of becoming legalist. Not in what you're saying, but in the spirit that I had in my mind to do it. We're just going to do it this way. If they don't like it, they can go home. How many hearts does that win? I said, Lord, I said, I need your help. Forgive me. And he spoke to us. He said, Sabbath was made for man. Make it fun. Made a campfire out back, and we're all sitting out there just chit-chatting and talking. And all of a sudden, one of the young people said, why don't we sing a song? And campfire songs, Christian songs, but campfire songs. You know what kind of songs they are. They're not boring, dry, blah. They're campfire songs. We sang probably, and I'm not a singer. I can't sing good, but I loved it. We sang probably for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And I watched, and by the end of the 20 or 30 minutes, the majority of those that don't go to church and don't profess faith in Christ were singing the songs with us. But they were watching because they saw the joy that was in us. We didn't tell them they had to or go home or else, but we were singing, and it's contagious. And I said, I said, you know, Wayne, I said, would you care if I read a scripture? So I read a scripture out of Psalms, 
Something simple about God's love for us and about His forgiveness. And then we sang. And then we read a couple more scriptures and we sang. And you know, by the time we got done, hearts were being won. And I could have done it my way and everybody would have went home, even the Christians. God says He'll make our wilderness like Eden. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. For truly, as I live, all the earth, the earth, your hearts, shall be filled with the glory of Jehovah. For this is my promise, my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and he's talking to Christ, but he's also talking to us because we're in Christ, right? He says, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy children, nor out of the mouth of thy children's children, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. Speak faith. Speak faith. That son that's gone, who's divorced his wife and left his family, that guy that's beating his wife and drinking every weekend, that teenager that has no interest in God, and they're listening to ACDC and all this filthy stuff out there, don't speak death over them. Speak life. God, you are able to save to the uttermost. You are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. If you speak faith, you will see miracles. Amen. I promise you. Since we're in Him, listen to what Scripture says. By Him, therefore, let us offer... What's that say? The sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto His name. You know, I used to read that and it's like the sacrifice of praise and sacrifice. It seems like it doesn't go together. Let me explain it to you. It's easy to praise God when the money's coming in. It's easy to praise God when your health is perfect. It's easy to praise God when everything's going right. It's a sacrifice when you praise Him when everything is blackness. And when you do that, you will see the miracle. We've got to hold on. And let each one of us show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. Look what the word hope means in Greek. To the full assurance of expectation of what you have confidence for. Jesus said, whatsoever things you ask, believing you shall receive. That doesn't mean a brand new car unless you know that God has promised to provide your needs and you need it. That we should not be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then look at the last one. For the joy of Jehovah is your strength. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. If He lives in me, He has faith. So how do we receive and share the blessings and the love of our Father in heaven with those who appear to have little or no interest in knowing Him or whom we have felt rejected by or that we may have injured and rejected in the past? Do you know, there's people in my life, my children, both of my, both of my children, a spirit, a demon of rejection attacked them continually from the day I left. I, I did not know this when it happened. But I remember the day that I had packed the U-Haul or the rider truck. I loaded everything into it, and I was pulling out of our gravel driveway. My son was three years old. My wife was standing on the porch holding him in her arms, tears falling down her face. My son was there, did not understand. He's only three. Is dad going to work? Where is he going? I didn't know my little girl was behind the truck as I was driving down the gravel road and she was so close to the truck I couldn't see her in the mirrors. And she was crying at the top of her lungs, Daddy, please don't leave. Do you know from the day that I left, fallen angels attacked my children with rejection? And when the Lord brought my wife and I back together, 
The demons didn't leave instantly just because we were reunited in marriage. It took prayer and it took faith and it took me speaking God's prayer, God's words, His promises over my children even when they couldn't hear me speaking them. I had to go to Him and say, Father, You promised and Christ has borne my curse upon the tree, even the curse of Your children. And I said, Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, you bore the curse of rejection because you were rejected by men. I ask that you will bear this curse for my children. And you know, God did. Christ did bear it. He delivered my son and my daughter from that. He delivered me and my wife from that. This is how you reach them. Ellen White says, love begets love, and blessing begets blessing. Write that reference down and read that. Love begets love. What is love? It is the sacrifice of self on behalf of someone who does not deserve it. The Lord told me, if you will begin to sacrifice for your wife, it will, it will come back to you. If you will sacrifice for your son and your daughter, it will come back to you. Now, I will never forget a story I heard Pastor Glenn Kuhn say. He told this story, and it was a true story. This woman, she had children, and her husband left. He was out committing an affair, and he was gone for months. She couldn't find him. He sent no support for the family. Finally, the police caught up with him, put him in jail. That's the law. And she was, like, furious, but she wanted him home. And you think, what is it that would make a woman want a man home? How did my wife want me to come home? I don't understand that. That's love. Why did Christ want to come rescue us? That's love. And this woman was there, and the, the police called her, and they said, we're going to let him out, but we've told him we want him to go home and be a man and, and stay with his family. And this was years ago. He came home, and she said, we went through the motions. He went to his job. We just went through the motions. And she said, I knew things were not right. And she said, she called, you know, to talk to Pastor Coon. And Pastor Coon shared something with her about reading, about love, begetting love. And she said the day came and she could tell that this husband of hers was at that point where he was ready to leave again. And finally that day he was getting ready to leave for work and he told her, he said, Tonight when I get home from work, he said, I'm gone, and you'll never find me this time. He got in his car, and he left for work, and she was like, what do I do? Here I thought the Lord had done a miracle, but his heart hadn't been won. His heart hadn't been won. And the Lord told her what to do. You know what she did? She went into the bedroom. She got out all of his best clothes, folded them unbelievably neat. She put his suitcase out there, packed everything neatly, she polished his shoes. She pressed and ironed all of his suits and his clothes and his ties. She made food for him. And he came home and everything's done. And he was like, I don't understand. What, what are you doing this for? And she said, well, if you really want to leave, I just want to make sure that you're safe and you have the things that you need. He got his stuff, walked out of the car. You know, stupid woman, what's wrong with her? I can't, she's crazy. I mean, who would do something like that? He gets, I don't remember if it was 100 or 200 miles away, and he had to pull off the road because that thought of what she did is still going through his mind. He can't get rid of it, even though he's committing adultery. Now, she could have told him, I'll send you back to jail. I know where you're going. That wouldn't have done any good. But she didn't. She loved him. She showed love. She sacrificed her own feelings on behalf of him. Do you know he turned around and came home? And when he walked in the door, he said, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to be here for a few more days. <laughs> Do you know that he gave his heart back to the Lord, was rebaptized, and they've been together for years? And she said, it's better than when we were married before. His heart was one. For God made a promise to Abraham, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thee. And all this simply because 
he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he is able also to perform. The word able there means full of power to perform. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom Abraham believed, even God who, what's that say? Quickeneth the dead. That's all of us. That's your loved ones. He quickeneth the dead. How do you... How does God quicken the dead? What did he say to Lazarus? He said, and you know what's funny? In Desire of Ages, Ellen White said, he said, Lazarus come forth because if he hadn't have spoken Lazarus' name, all the dead would have risen. That's how powerful he is. He calleth those things which be not as though they already were. My wife used to, tell, used to tell people, he's my husband, he's coming home. And I can remember she'd go to the church, in the Adventist church, and they, did, they were like everybody. They're like all of us. He's been gone for three years. He's got somebody else for three years. Why are you telling your children your, your, that their dad's coming home? And they told my wife, many people did, well-meaning people, you're going to destroy their faith in God by telling them that. Because what if he doesn't come home? And you know what my wife said? My wife, what if? My wife said, if you don't believe, don't pray for me. Yeah. She said that. If you don't believe, I don't want your prayers. God's word says he's coming home. And I'm going to hold on to that. And my wife held on to that for five years. And I remember the day, and I've told this story before, but I remember the day that... My wife said she was impressed to go to this mall in another town in Bristol. We don't even live in Bristol. And she went to that mall, and she's sitting there in the mall with our two little children. She said, I didn't even, I was desperate. I didn't even know what I was doing there. You know, you're just trying to fill the time. And she said, I'm sitting there thinking, it's been years. It's been a couple of years. When is God going to hear my prayer? When is he going to answer? And she said that this tall man, dressed nice, came walking across the mall. She's sitting here and he's walking this direction. And she said he was looking straight into my eyes. And she said, it made me nervous because I didn't know who this man was, but he looked like he knew me. And she said, you know, I stood up and she said he came over to her and he said, young woman, this morning when I was on my knees seeking the Lord, the Lord told me to come to this mall today. And he told me that I would find you here with your two children and he told me to tell you this, your prayers have been answered, your husband is coming home. It was two years later before I came home. But do you know that one voice of the Lord through that one human being gave my wife the faith and the hope to believe the impossible. He calleth those things which be not as though they already are. You are a child of the living God. I know you're smoking pot. I know you're drinking. I know you're... But God loves you and He is going to save you. I believe that. He has a calling on your life. And they go, I don't even know who God is. How do you know He has a calling on my life? Because when He raised Christ Jesus from the dead, every one of us were raised in Him. Amen. That's why it hurts Christ so bad when people will refuse to be saved. That's why it calls it his strange act when God has to destroy the wicked. He's like, I've paid for you. You were already redeemed. How bad does that hurt him? Christ's servants, us, are his representatives. We are the channels for his working. And he desires through us to exercise his healing power. Through his servants, God designs that the sick, the unfortunate, even those possessed by evil spirits shall hear his voice. Through his human agencies, God desires to be a comforter such as the world knows not. For Jesus said, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. 
And in that last day, the great day of the feast, tabernacles, Jesus, Yeshua, stood and he cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on my words, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe should receive. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A couple of promises. Write these down and claim these for those that you know need the Lord. He says, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made you, and I that formed you from the womb, I will pour water upon them that are thirsty. I will pour floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy children and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up. That means bear fruit as among the grass, as willow trees by the water streams. For my doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And Ephraim, your children, your mothers, your fathers, your brothers and sisters shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? For now through you I have heard him, and I have observed him, and now I am like a green fir tree. From me, from thee, O Lord, is thy fruit found. That's what God wants. He says, I will make them and the places round about my mountain a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in this season. And there shall be showers of blessing. Are we not living in the time of the latter rain? Then why don't we ask for this? Those disciples in that upper room, the reason the Holy Spirit was poured out was because they said, God, you promised us. And we can't do this work without you. And they would not let go until the blessing was received. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, in their homes. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. That's talking about the fallen angels. When demons and fallen angels and the devil is working against us, he's pitting husbands against wives and wives against husbands and children against their parents and parents against their children. God says, I will break their yoke. And he says, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Break forth into joy. O oh, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. Yea, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. That's us. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, but he will cause to come down for you the early and the latter rain in the first month. And I promise I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have devoured. And you shall eat my promises in plenty. Remember he said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He says, take my words and eat them. Check and see if I won't do what I've promised. He says, you shall eat in plenty and shall be satisfied. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. For blessed is that man and woman that trusteth in me. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And my people shall never be ashamed. For I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. And I will lead you in paths which you have not known. Yea, I will make darkness light before them. And the crooked things I will make straight. These things will I do unto you, and I will not forsake you. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, imagine this, 
Look at the people. When God did what he did for my wife and my children and I, I had no idea the people's lives that that would change. And I'm nothing. I'm, I'm the dirtiest, wickedest, most awful sinner you all have, have ever met. My life is so filthy in my past, but praise God, it's gone. The heathen that look at us. How many times have you heard of somebody coming into a Seventh-day Adventist church and them saying, they, they weren't friendly. There was no love. And then you hear people in the church say, but we've got truth. What is truth? It's the verity of God's word. Us having the joy of the Lord is as much a command as to keep the Sabbath holy. And that's the only way we can keep it holy. It has to be Christ in us. He says, the heathen that are left round about shall know that I, Jehovah, build the ruined places and I plant that that was desolate. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. You read Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22 through 36, and underline or make a mark or write on a piece of paper every single time it says, I will. I want to ask you all to come up front with me. I want us to pray together as a family. I want to pray for our families. Brother David, do you mind holding hands with me? It's Carol. You guys come hold hands with us. This is important. How many people in here have got somebody that you know right now you can think about or even yourself that you think, I want more. I want the peace that passes all understanding. I want to know the love. I want to know his love. Do you have family members? Let's ask him for that. Wayne, would you pray for us? Father in heaven, we bow before you this afternoon humbled because we recognize that none of us have lived as holy and righteous lives as your son who always lived to do your will. He delighted to do your will. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have loved ones, friends, family, neighbors fellow church members who are not right with you. And Father, we confess to you that we must share part of the responsibility for that. Amen. For Amen. our lives have not reflected your glory as they should. Amen. We have too often given words of condemnation or even through our actions showed that we felt that we were holier, that saying I am holier than thou. But Father, Help us to recognize that there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us have any goodness of ourselves. Amen. Each one of us are dependent upon the righteousness of your beloved Son. Amen. It is only through him that we have, any of us have hope. It is only through him that we are holy in your eyes. It is only through Amen. him that we have your peace and your fellowship and your truth. And every blessing and good thing that we enjoy is through your Son, Christ. Father, what do we have that has not been given to us by Amen. your grace? Amen. And Father, to the extent that we individually have been blessed, we owe a debt to those around us who do not have these privileges and opportunities. Thank you, Father, that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My son reminded me recently of Sister White. And how when she was converted, she began to pray for her friends until one by one, everyone on her prayer list had been converted. Amen. Father, we believe that you are mighty to save and you are able to do the same today. Thank you for these precious promises that Brother Eric has shared with us this afternoon. 
Thank you for the testimony of how you were able to change his life and bring a miracle of reconciliation in his life. And we pray that you would use us in these last days to give to others the last revelation that you want to give to a dark and sinful world, the revelation of your character, Father. We pray that you would do this work. You would finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. For this world is not our home. We can see by the, the, the way this world is falling apart around us that time is short. But, Father, this is not a time to fear, for perfect love casts out all fear. But this is a time to lift up our heads and rejoice, for our redemption draweth nigh. Thank you for this blessed hope that is ours, and may it burn brightly in the hearts of each one that we are praying for and that we are working for. We pray in the name of Yeshua, your beloved Son. Amen. 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 And let's keep, let's keep each other and our families in prayers. Even if we don't remember one another's names, let's do.